Hello guys and welcome to Imperator Rome. Now I've played a couple hundred hours of this game now and I thought I would start making some guides like I do for other strategy games. Imperator Rome is a big game that takes a lot of systems from other Paradox titles and meshes them all into one big game. So I figured I'd start with a beginner's guide to cover all these systems vaguely rather than dive too deep on anything because while it does have a lot None of it is exceptionally deep, given how much variety it has. So you just start up as Rome, of course, in Imperator Rome, and you look at the map and what the hell is all this? It doesn't even look like this the first time you boot it up. Probably looks more like this, which doesn't look too different from above, but zoomed in, probably does. There is a lot of different ways to look at this map. Down in the map modes, you see here, you can have two rows of buttons to allow you to see what you want on the map from the terrain map mode which still kind of shows you the borders to just the political map mode which really focuses on those colors the diplomacy map mode to see relations in the world etc etc and one common thing i see new players run into the problem of is they don't know how to customize this well it's quite simple see this little cog here click it and then you'll go through this list find whatever map mode you want or need and then you'll take it You'll click it, you'll drag it, see how I have the little icon now, and you drag it to whatever spot here you want. So, let's say I put the political map mode right here, it replaces my diplomacy map mode. I'll put that back, I click, hold, and drag, and there you go. That is how you customize this, it will remember how you've customized it, and you can figure out how to customize yours in a way that works for you, just as I figured out a way for me. Now that you know how to look at the map, let's look at looking at your own country. So we're of course playing as Rome. There are three different ways I would say, I would categorize to look at your own country. There's a couple different ways to do it. There's this button right here. This is a button, yes, but it's also this. These are both the same button and weird enough, they make different sounds. This is your nation overview. You can get a brief glimpse of a lot of different statistics going on in your nation here. Your heritage, the power base total, of your nation, which is a mechanic that splits power among the population with characters, sort of like Crusader Kings, if you have played Crusader Kings. You can see the different pops in your nation here, vaguely, without too much detail, as well as their religion and their cultures. This is kind of like the Victoria series, if you've ever played the Victoria series. And then you can see some decisions you can make here. These decisions allow you to, well, do special things that either only your nation can do or that can move your nation into a different direction such as changing your government type or you know those unique things like establishing a specific temple there's little alerts that you can enable or disable the x shows you that you can't do it a check mark shows you that you can do it this alert will let you know up here if you can do them hovering over literally anything in this game will give you some kind of way to view the effects of that thing as well as the requirements. These buttons up here are to allow you to change your ideas, which is a selection of bonuses that consume political influence that will stay here until you change them or change government types. And you basically just pick what you want. They must match a slot that you have available. Different government types have different slots. Speaking of political influence, you can see it's generated by different characters and things in your nation. It's very slow to generate thing. There are a couple different ways to use it, but it's used mainly for things that involve spreading your nation's influence or changing things within your nation. It's one of many resources, as you can see, which we will go over more and more of them as we go along. Another way to look at your nation would be through the government screen. And the government screen has a little more depth to it. So this is going to look very, very different depending on what nation you start up as. If you start up as a monarchy or a barbarian nation, it's not going to look like this. It looks like this because we are a republic. Republics have a senate. And you can see the split between the three different parties, and there will always be three parties. For Rome, these parties are named. You can hover over them, get some flavor text on them. You can see what their priorities are, their agendas. They will try to do these things. You can try to influence different ones of them for political influence and other things, depending what kind of party they are. Certain things will just add tyranny. Certain things will cost money and certain things will cost manpower. It really depends what the parties stand for. Only the ruling party, the one who the leader is a part of, the main leader, you might have two leaders like this, can force through anything. If you were a monarchy, 
you would have up here where you can see support in the Senate from the three different parties, which determines what you can and cannot do. You know, if this is under 50%, then you'll actually be tyrannical if you try to do anything. If this is above 50%, then the Senate will support you in pretty much everything that you do. If you're a monarchy, this will be legitimacy, it will determine how legit your rule is of your family, of your current leader. It's a very important stat. Right up here will always be an important stat. It's a bit simpler for barbarians. They don't really have to worry about these kinds of things. The ruler popularity and the character popularity will determine bonuses for your leaders. For some government types like monarchies, popularity is actually very important because it affects a number of other things. Again, I'd suggest looking at your tooltips here to get a better idea of what everything here does and what the conditions are. Additionally, on this screen, no matter what government type you'll have, you'll have other little actions here. For example, summoning the war council. This allows you to get claims on other countries around you. And there will be different actions other than that that will vary based on what nation you are. On this screen, you can also check your offices. These are characters assigned to different offices. You'll want to manage these based on who has the best of the relevant stats to that office, as well as looking at your great families to make sure they're happy because you've assigned them enough jobs or not. If you haven't, you might want to try some political appointments instead of just going based on who has the best stats, you know. And then finally, we have our laws. These laws have a gigantic amount of effects, but this is where you come to change them. It will cost stability. It will cost political influence. If you have these, feel free to spend them as you please. Every nation and government type is going to have a different series of laws to change to. Some of these are only unlockable once you get to a certain tech level, and we'll get to more of that later. The third and final way I would describe as being able to view your nation is by right-clicking it on the map. And this is another completely different display. There's a lot of previews of information, some of which is up here, some of which you found little displays of as well by looking somewhere else, like in the nation overview. And you can also see a lot of your diplomatic information this way. You can see your stance. You can change your stance by clicking here to get different bonuses, maybe towards being bellicose, towards, you know, taking things over. Domineering if you thrive off of subjects. Mercantile if you thrive off of trade. Neutral, appeasing, you name it. You can see your diplomatic relations, your limits, and when you will suffer political power influence penalties when you go over you could still see your ideas here you can see certain values of tech levels your navy get little ideas like that and then you can right click on any country and get this exact information this is the most basic way to look at every country in the game a lot of the other information is not communicated by looking at your nation or even up here but by looking at more of these little sub panels if what you've seen so far still misses some information you're looking for. You might be looking for the ledger at the top right. This is a way to get very good information about any nation in the world. As you can see here, population, navy, territories, etc., etc. Even stability, tyranny, aggressive expansion, war exhaustion. You could also look at your history of rulers or the rulers of other nations. You can look at your specific provinces here and stats about them. You can look at the way technology and other things modify the cohorts that make up your military, etc. Now, if you're looking more in depth on other things you can use to manage your nation, we have the economy tab here. It's pretty straightforward. There's three settings for a bunch of different things, taxes, commerce, tributes, maintenances, and character wages. These values, what they give, what they demand, will change as you grow in size. If you look back at that handy right-click view, we hover over here, you can read there that there are different nation levels, migrant hordes, city-states, local powers, regional powers, major powers, great powers. The bigger you get, the harder it is to control your nation. And you can see kind of the effects above that from our current power as a local power. Certain things will get better as you grow and certain things will get worse. For example, wages will go up, but relation slots will also go up. The mercenary armies you can hire will go up, but other things will worsen. You'll unlock new features in the game, etc, etc. And so that will affect all of the values that you see everywhere. But this is a good way to find values to modify. On the right is usually increasing things from increasing pay for maintenance to decreasing it, but not exactly over here. There is this specific one that's a bit standout. Left isn't to decrease, it's just a different tactic. You can either choose to have a transaction taxation here, which prioritizes your imports, 
or free trade, which prioritizes your export value, or in the middle, which actually just gives you import routes, which is a way to acquire more resources from abroad because Imperator Rome is still a Europa Universalis game and is the sequel to Europa Universalis Rome. And so it has all the resource features as well that you would expect in addition to its Crusader Kings and Victoria-like features. And there's even some Hearts of Iron 3, I'll say 3 because, you know, th anything beyond 3, like 4 really, really changes Hearts of Iron incredibly to be unrecognizable. So 3 and before Hearts of Iron features are in this as well. We'll get to that when we get to military. But next on the tabs here on the left, we have religion. This is a screen you're going to come to a lot because there's a lot of things you can do here. If you click on any of these, you'll see these are your gods. These are your deities that you have selected to worship. You'll have some starting ones at the default. They have passive bonuses and active bonuses. You'll see the active ones are all grayed out right now because there's a little thing here, a little notification telling me you can call down an omen. To do this, I would just click, have a little pop-up. It'll tell me the last five years. No other omens can be called in that time. This is what it will grant. And these values are, of course, modified by other things. We select it, and now you see this is now highlighted because it is active. We are gaining its benefit. In addition, you can change your deities based on what religion you are to other things. You can preview all their bonuses, passive and active, as well as see whether or not, like this, they have holy sites and where those might be. Holy sites can be used to store treasures, treasures which are located here in your reliquary. They provide different bonuses based on the size of the settlement you put them in. If it's a normal settlement, you can only put one. If it's a city, you can put two. If it's a metropolis, which is the biggest, then you can put three. So placing these in important places is important. They can be deconstructed either by your militaries in the field with a special action. Like if you select something, you'll have special actions here when you're looking at your military units. It's kind of like that. Or, if you go back to the religion screen, you can also just go here into ones that are in your territory and simply desecrate them from there. That will give some penalties, but it will also allow you to plant the holy site somewhere else if you so choose. You can, of course, preview the religions here. This is a more focused view, and you can see little bonuses to your religious buffs here that their deities give based on the split of your population. And then there's important things here, like perform divine sacrifice allows you to get stability easier. This is very important. You'll be doing this like all, all game. And evoke devotio, which is more important if you're dealing with war exhaustion, which really depends on your playstyle. Here we have cultures, and I've already been asked to do a culture management tutorial, and I probably will. But to touch on this vaguely, this is where you can see all your different pops what they are between slaves, tribesmen, freemen, citizens, nobles. You can see their culture split. You can see and you can sort as well by population and other things here, the different cultures that you have. Cultures are incredibly important. You can integrate some, you can give some specific rights to appease them. You can even try to preview them on the map a little bit using some of these buttons. But they are very important. Cultures that are not in your culture group so my culture group is Latin, for example. If we look at the culture map here, you'll see all this red is not Roman, it is Latin. So they'll like me more than anybody except Roman, and they'll be happier in my nation. But if I start taking over barbarians or the Greeks, you name it, the Hellenics, anything that is not this color, basically, they're going to become unhappy in my rule. I might need to integrate them, which can be done by changing their civic right to citizen or above, but that will make my own integrated, already integrated cultures unhappy. Some nations start with multiple integrated cultures, but make that one in specific happier. And there's other reasons to do that, such as, for example, you can get access to things that make them great. So for example, military tactics that the Greeks would have, you'd have to integrate some Greeks in order to be able to research that, let's say. Moving on to the trade overview, this is an overview of all trade that you are doing. You can sort by exports, imports, or specifically domestic trade. You can automate it by hitting accept all trades, and so then you just won't have to review them, otherwise they will pop up up here. And this is kind of like a backup. If you have accept all trades on, then you can enable this right here, so you will never lose any bonuses to your nation by having a surplus of that resource in your capital region. 
from these trades. Like it will all automatically just decline any trade that would break that because that's kind of important. Otherwise, you just leave this off and manage it all by yourself. You can even automate it and determine what is permitted to request for, what is not permitted to request for, whether you have it automated or not. You can also preview every single resource you have a surplus of at your capital, and this will provide some sort of bonus to your entire nation. And you can also just go click on your capital here and then see that as well by just looking for anything that has a plus one, at least. You can also import resources here, and there are a lot of resources, and we're not going over them now, but there are a lot of resources here. The first is the standard bonus to any region that has it or imports it, and then the surplus in the capital is special. Only your capital region can get this enabled. This will allow you to get a nationwide bonus if you have at least that plus one, meaning you have one extra of that resource there. So find what is good for you find what you like and you can work on it from there and while we're here we might as well look at a couple other things you can automate trade anywhere by just clicking this button you can see great wonders which have different tiers based on your prestige that will give more and more bonuses based on what they are for example this one gives omen power pretty good then there's the way you can build things you can go to any city or settlement and this little button that allows you to build things cities and metropolises share buildings um, settlements have their own buildings. Settlements are these non-urbanized areas. You can also see your pops or get a preview even of them up here to see who they are, what they can do. If you wish to build a city, you can do that. And to do that, you click this to expand this little menu stream right here. And you see found city right here. It has some resource requirements as well. Same thing, you can revoke city status and found a metropolis. It used to be way, way easier to find this in the original version of the game, but then they updated the entire UI and dude, it took me so long to find out where these were <laughs> again. You can also change the capital of certain regions with these buttons, as well as the capital of your whole nation, as well as dedicate new holy sites for resources. You can preview your governor of any region and change him, assuming it's not you, your leader. You could change policies of your own regions, as well as those of others, but if you're a republic, I think this will change pretty much every time your leader changes. Otherwise, I think it'll retain whatever you set it to. If you're a monarchy, for example, and if it's a governor that's not you, whenever a new governor takes power, they are just going to change this stuff. So be wary of if spending political influence on this stuff is actually worthwhile. Here's those stats again, your cultures, your religion, and the population demographic split can be previewed on a regional basis by simply clicking around. You see everything. Also, food, which is, of course, important, and the loyalty of the region. If it gets under about a third of loyalty, it will just stop doing anything. Like, you won't be able to build anything. You won't be able to deconstruct anything. It will just stop listening to you unless you get that back up. Certain things can inspire loyalty, such as certain buildings. Start looking at effects. Certain buildings can affect loyalty, such as a court of law here will affect loyalty slightly. Otherwise, loyalty comes down to just keeping everybody happy. So you'd want to keep all the cultures and religions here happy to keep cultures happy. You know, it's as simple as going and giving them more rights, integrating them or giving them specific things such as rights of inheritance, intermarriage, things that grant them permanent happiness bonuses. And so that's where that comes in handy. There's other things too, like text, but look at that when we get to text. So military. Now here's where the hearts of iron ish things come in so there's levies legions and traditions levies are units that are based on your population and your culture determines what you can raise so based on the culture of the main region of rome italia we can summon quite a bit three supply trains 17 light infantry five light cavalry and eight heavy infantry magna gratia which i believe is yeah it's down here you could summon less there's not as many pops there for a pop to generate military units it must be integrated so right now that's basically only romans for me any other culture will produce money and work but they are not allowed to serve in the military so if we raise the levies this forms an army it's a temporary army we don't want to keep this raised forever there's bonuses like hurting our tech etc etc basically taking working pops and using them to fight and certain laws we have in the government screen here will determine uh, military reforms right here will determine how many of these we can have and other effects like that there are also the legions which 
they're going to look just like this. The legions can be summoned only if you have the correct law and technology, unless you have a certain event that allows you to enable it early. Rome will theoretically get this event the earliest. Legions are a permanent form of army. They cannot have as many units in them. However, they can be trained to be far more elite. You can customize the unit types within them and they cost, you know, money rather than hurting your research because you're just pulling out your citizens that would be researching things to fight. This is where you have special bonuses, for example, desecrating holy sites. Every army, based on what units are in it, you know, they can have a different tactic that has more or less bonuses. You can see what units here contribute to a certain tactic that you are using. You can see how effective in total the units you have brought will be with a certain tactic because of that, and you can see what that tactic will be good against. Other tactics, for example, envelopment is good against phalanxes and deception. But, you know, shock action right here, which is what we have, it's not as good against, etc, etc. So you may not even want to pick what your dudes are best with. You may want to try to predict what your enemies will be using based on their culture and their unit makeup to determine what you bring, because they'll have the same restrictions, you know? This is where that, like, Hearts of Iron 3 starts showing up now because now we have different lines every single unit and there can be different units can be assigned to a part of the line so we have the flanks for example our light cavalry are on that and we can either widen the flank to 10 units shrink it to two or have it at five that is our choice we can have a front line which you know for example we would want to put light infantry because that's what we have and then, or, you know, heavy infantry to engage because of the heavier units have the light infantry come back them up and fill in the lines after that. There's a bunch of different ways to do this. Every unit is good at a different thing. They all have different stats, stats that you can see by hovering over them. And you can find them in numerous different ways, such as by looking in your army, looking at the armies of others. And you can see the maneuver, which is how far they can hit. Those units are generally good for flanking their movement speed. If you want fast armies, how much food they need or can hold and their effectiveness against other specific types of units. Combat will go like any other standard Paradox game where you just take your unit here, you right click it, it'll run there, and then eventually like a battle will happen and that's pretty much it. But it will play out a lot more like Hearts of Iron 3 and whatnot where you'll see the front line, you'll see the units coming up behind, you'll see the flanks, and you'll see the effects they're all having on the screen. It can fly by really quickly, but it is all being simulated there. Depending on tech level, your armies can be used to build roads. They can be used to train, for example, especially if they are legions. You can see their experience here. Experience is important because it will allow you, and this is the next thing, to get military traditions. And as Rome, we start out with Roman traditions and Italic tribe traditions. These all give many different bonuses, and some of them can unlock completely different trees. For example, this one right here. If we unlock a Hellenistic culture group, if we integrate one, and then we unlock this if it's a big enough one, we have like enough of our population is Hellenistic, then we can unlock their trees. So that would be the Greek trees. We would unlock these two by going down that path. Or there's another path here as well. I know that. Yeah, right here for barbarian trees, which would be the Celtic and Britannic ones. And with this, you can unlock every single tree if you integrate all the right cultures, you know, before they assimilate into your culture, which is always happening, by the way. Your cultures are always assimilating if they're not integrated. So only integrate if you don't want to assimilate. And there's things to speed up assimilation, such as founding colonies. There's also certain buildings that help it, et cetera, et cetera. Very important. We'll get more into that in a culture tutorial. The next tab we have are mercenaries. Mercenaries are kind of like legions, except they're not yours. They cost money. They prevent you from earning experience as much to develop those traditions but you can hire them for a hundred money plus a certain upkeep that is affected by modifiers when not hired they will grow as the world and the populations around them grow they have their own cultural splits to their units they can serve a lot of the same functions that legions can but you can get them at the start of the game and you can choose to rely on them rather than using your own levies that's what the Carthaginians would do, for example. It's also naval mercenaries. These are essentially just pirates. They base themselves usually out of pirate ports and they have their own kinds of ships as well. Ships are different, by the way, than normal land units. Ships can be built by going to any location that has a port. And you go ahead to this little tab, tactical, you build ships. Build any ship that you have the size and traditions to build. 
You can also just select a fleet and you can click the, there's a button for it here. Build two Navy, just build anything from any port that you have that can build this thing. It'll just kind of pick it at random and you can select that to build right there. As for building buildings as well as ships, you can do that in a macro way here. Let's say I just want to build a bunch of ports. You know, I just select it here. Then I pick a province here or I go around to these, you know, different settlements where they're green and click them. Red means, well, you can't put it here or it's already full. And then there's also city buildings. So I can put ports uh, in the city buildings as well. Uh, aqueducts, you know, it's going to highlight all the cities that have room. And then there's ships I can specifically pick like, oh, I want to build this ship here, here, here without actually going there. Under that, we have diplomacy. This is just another way to kind of get that same view I showed you by right clicking. I'd really be surprised if you ever use this tab ever. Really, just ever when you could just right click. I certainly never use it. Here's your text. Um, where the hell's my text? There we go. So there's four different tech trees and this works a notably bit differently than when the game released. You start out with innovations. Every time this little bar here fills up, you get an innovation. So you might assume that when you research the next military level that you would need to put that military innovation here, right? Well, no, you don't have to put it in military because these innovations are general. I could have like eight saved up innovations and they all came from military. That will never happen. But let's say I did. I could go put them all into religious advances if I want. When I research one thing, I could put it into any and every tree that I want. And there's all these different trees. Religion is just one big tree. Oratory split into two, usually. Civics, two. And military, three. They all have different focuses. Usually this is land, military. This is usually fortifications and sieges. This is usually naval stuff. Civics, this is usually where you go for making money. This is usually where you go for productivity and efficiency, as I would describe it. Oratory, this is usually for your internal politics and this is usually for your external politics and then religious just has a lot of different bonuses even down to like ruler popularity and culture happiness that you might be looking for but you might just want to take maybe 20 minutes to just digest these screens and like i mentioned this has characters you've been seeing them researchers that you can assign leaders that can take power elections monarchs generals and governors that you can assign if you're ever just looking for all your characters you can do so right here you can also see the characters of other nations like this. You could type in a name, like I can look up Naeus. See, we got two people named Naeus. Cool, that's great. And you could filter by own nation only. You can even select another nation to see there specifically. You could see different things about them, their power bases. You can also click on them to see them and interact with them with a very similar screen as you would have for interacting with a nation. There's a bunch of different things you can do. It's different based on who you're interacting with. You can also see the great families in your nation, the amount of jobs that they want to have, the amount that you've given them, their power bases, which is essentially their influence, their prestige, which is going to compound their power bases, and the characters in these families. Not all the characters in your nation are in these families. Some of them, like Naeus right here, and these guys right here, with, see they're missing these little great family markers in the corner. They are not in great families. So they are essentially less valuable to assign to things because they won't make a great family happy. The bigger you get, the more great families you acquire. The more great families you have, that's the more members you'll generally have to put into other jobs and thus not be able to assign the most efficient person to the job. If you're ever feeling lost on what to do, if this is always just a little too overwhelming and you're looking around like, damn, there's so much I can't figure out what to do, then you come down here into missions. It'll give you some goals if you're having trouble setting your own. Now there is an end date. The game lasts roughly like 270 years by default. It shows the Roman calendar, but you can also see the, the BC, just normal calendar here. For some reason there's an E here. I don't know why, that seems kind of stupid. But uh, if you want to see the date you might be more familiar with, here it is, just delete the E and you'll understand it just fine. And then the Roman calendar is here by default. Someone did make a mod to replace this number, by the way, if you're looking for that. And so, yeah, you'll have objectives here. Some of them are generic. Some of them are special. Some of them are locked behind DLC because we're Paradox. We don't ever make a full, complete game. And you just simply start a mission. You'll have different objectives. 
I can start one like this. This one has a timer. Usually when they have timers, events will pop up. They'll grant you things. They'll tell you what they'll grant you. Some of them are very warlike, such as this one. And they will grant me claims, which I can actually see, which I don't have any right now. But if I'm looking at myself in the diplomacy map mode, I'll be able to see claims because they'll be like marked like stripes. Like, oh, I have a claim on this. And there's other ones for building up places that you already have. The special things are definitely always going to be better. These are like Hearts of Iron 4 focus trees. They're always going to be better than the generic ones. So it's always good to have a mission active, even if you're not relying on it for the goals, unless you just really don't like using missions. You can abort one as well. It has some consequences. You can't restart the mission for like 20 years. And when you're done, when you've completed the final objectives in a mission, just hit finish mission right here. It'll finish and then you can pick another one. There's a lot of different ways to get territory in this game. You know, you could go to war. That's the most obvious. See these little places up here? These are not settled. You could colonize them if you're next to them or you have some sort of waterway going to them. So this right here is pretty big for barbarian nations, this big stretch as a result. Heck, if you're playing barbarian, migratory tribes could just pick up and then just come transplant their nation somewhere else, somewhere much safer. In addition, you can get nations as subjects and then when you do have them as subjects, which we do, you see these uh, blue ones here, then you could go and integrate them there's different kinds of subjects, but we'll get into that more later. And by later, I mean in another tutorial. So that's kind of the basics, maybe, and then some. That's generally more... No, that's a lot more than the tutorial will teach you. The tutorial of this game is AIDS. But you now know a lot. Feel free to, you know, rewind and reference things as you need to. If there's anything you specifically would like to see a more in-depth guide on in this game, even if it's a short topic, because that's what a lot of things in this game are going to be. Just let me know in the comments below, and I will see about answering your questions, if you have any, or turning, if they're big enough, into a full-fledged tutorial about certain things, such as culture management, because it's very important. It's probably pretty important to cover. And with that, I hope this guide was helpful. I hope any future guides will be helpful. Thank you guys very much for watching, and I'll see you some other time.